Ah, thank you, Jackie, and all my uh, all the people who work so hard for archaeology in Jacksonville. I'm happy to see friends, colleagues, former students, and all you lion lovers. When I first started studying uh, art history of the Aegean Bronze Age, what do I hit? I want it to advance one. Nope. Okay. This was my territory, which is essentially mainland Greece. That big island of Crete and a scattering of little rocky islets in the Aegean Sea. So it's kind of a circle in here. The setting was always larger. It was the Eastern Mediterranean which would include the big, uh, the ancient cultures of the Near East and Egypt. So essentially, the eastern end of the Mediterranean was my territory. And my time frame <clears throat> was older than most people think of when you think of Greece. Normally, you think of classical Greece with the Parthenon and Pericles. Sorry, I want to be able to do that. The, the pointer. Oh, the pointer's right there. Yeah. Okay, well, it's older than that. It's the period from 1000 back to 3000 BCE, which is the second and third millennia BCE, which is very old, and most people don't think about that when you think about classical Greece. But it's a wonderful time because it includes Troy and Agamemnon and Brad Pitt and Helen of Troy. And of course, the awful wooden horse, many wonderful stories there. And it includes this character, Heinrich Schliemann, who the self-made archaeologist who excavated Troy in the 1870s, trying to validate Homer's stories. And then he moved over to the mainland of Greece, where he uncovered uh, really Mycenae and Tyrans and other of the, the huge citadels that had been the other side of the Trojan War. So he validated the Trojan side and the Greek side. And in doing that, he uncovered so many treasures that people had had no idea existed in the shaft graves at Mycenae, piles of gold, and what looked like the face of Agamemnon, that he established a, a brand new civilization on the map, the history map. And, and not many people can do that, but he did. And the name he gave it was Mycenaean, which to us involves the late Bronze Age, the very end of that early period, from about 1600 to about 1000 BC, last little bit before 1000. That's the cutoff between Bronze Age, when bronze was the preferred metal, and after that, the Iron Age, which in a way we're still in, because we still use iron, which is steel, unless we're now in the electronic age. He found so many lions that it was clear that in the Bronze Age, lions were the preferred animal, the emblem of the leadership. And sure enough, there were a lot of lions in classical Greece, too. Homer had talked about them. Uh, here's a, in the lower right-hand side, a mosaic showing Alexander fighting lions. They were all over Greek pots. So it seemed reasonable to think that with lions depicted in the Bronze Age and the classical period, that they must have really existed. So that was the question. Did wild lions really roam in, as native animals in ancient Greece? Now I'm going to show you three kinds of testimony for it and then demolish it. 
one at a time. The ancient testimony. Homer, of course, said in very vivid descriptions, terrible things, what lions did. And they said he couldn't have said that unless he'd actually seen some. Herodotus, this is the key. He said, when Xerxes invaded Greece, lions came down out of the mountains near Mount Olympus and attacked the camels in Xerxes' train to get at the grain they were carrying. And then, a hundred years later, Aristotle repeated the same thing and gave a geographical location, which was a couple of rivers in northern Greece as the territory. But this was a big deal, what Herodotus said, because he wrote it or he dictated it in a book that was written down called The Persian Wars, in which he told all kinds of things about that huge set of invasions. And because the Xerxes had actually crossed the Hellespont and marched down into Greece with his huge army and then sent his navy over, and it looked like a done deal for the Greeks. And the Spartans had been wiped out to a man at Thermopylae, and Xerxes came on into Athens and burnt it. And Pericles was off on a nearby island with his family watching the flames. Everybody remembered it because it was incredible that the next day the Greek Navy defeated the Persian Navy. And Xerxes hightailed it home, vowing to return, which he never did, but they never knew when he might try it. So about 30 years later, Herodotus wrote the history of those uh, events. And he's been said to be the first real historian because he tried to distinguish between facts and fiction or news and fake news. Now, he told the tales, he told the fanciful tales, too. But he usually said something like, they say, but I may not believe it, or a silly story, blah, blah, blah. blah. But when he told about the lions coming down, he told that as fact. Because Herodotus was believed and Aristotle had repeated him, modern testimony backed up the existence of real lions. So I just picked a couple of uh, well-known scholars of their day who believed that, yes, the Mycenaeans who made that wonderful lion art had actually seen real lions. Now, the second category of evidence was fast photography or stop action photography and the imagery itself. These are two uh, excellent Bronze Age scholars who realized that if you looked at films from Africa and looked at what lion behavior really was, and now you could see it with this stop action photography on the left, you would see that the clustering of a pride of lionesses jumping all at once on a victim was portrayed very realistically in some Mycenaean art, coming from the front, the back, even underneath, and taking that animal down. Or as this one, the lion grabbing the animal with his paws and his jaws and circling the head is almost exactly like the image on the back of the famous lion hunt dagger that Schliemann found. So that validated. There was a school of thought in the 70s and 80s, of uh, the 1970s and 80s, that yes, definitely there had been at least some wild lions in Greece because of these films. And the third category was osteological or bones. And as of 1980, there is a meager little bit. There were some teeth from one tooth from Mycenae, which now who knows where. Three lion teeth from the island of Caia, just off the coast of Attica. And, oh, ah, a heel bone. A heel bone found at Tyrant by a bona fide, excellent zooarchaeologist recently. Now let's demolish it. 
All right. The ancient testimony. Homer, well, he was poet if he even existed. And he never went to Greece, you know. He didn't live in Greece. He lived over off the coast of Turkey. So we won't count him. Hmm, Herodotus, yeah, but a bobcat, a mountain lion. Who, who could say what animal actually came down and attacked those camels? And for Aristotle, the truth is, he did say so many wacky things about leonine anatomy. He didn't know how many vertebrae they had. He didn't know how many teeth they had. People finally began to discount even the great man himself. So we can dump all that. Now, the modern testimony, if you aren't believing Herodotus and Aristotle, well, then let's, you know, let's, what's the basis of saying that these uh, animals actually existed? So the people who began to write about uh, lions in the later 20th century generally did not believe that they existed. Photography, mm. for every realistic image that you can find of the way the lions were portrayed in Greece, you can find some really odd things like this one. A male lion with a big mane and teeth nursing. Oh, I don't think they even knew the difference of the sex by that argument. And this thing, how did... You know, you get twisted at the middle of the waist, contortion, crazy, impossible anatomy. So, really, we don't think they saw a lot. So, where did the imagery come from, if not nature? Well, it came from art, of course, was the argument. On the left is an, a seal from my skinny. It was very tiny, but it shows two rampant lions on one, each side of a figure. And there are endless images of such heraldic constructions from Egypt and the Near East on small items that could be brought in. So clearly, all they had to do was look at these little imports and copy the image. Or they could even copy their own stuff. John Younger at Duke wrote a big article that was in the AJA in the 1970s, where he said the uh, Mycenaean Bafio Lion Master had created that signature gold head, the reton of a lion, and then proceeded to inspire himself and others to just copy the head. Look at this, this, the bent uh, gold metal design on the cheeks of the lion. That showed up in about 18 other signature lion pieces. So it looked like they just copied themselves in their big lion art. So what about the last? Teeth and heel. Any pelt of a lion will have teeth and foot bones in it because that's what they want when they send a pelt around for a gift or to put in your in your palace, the head and the feet go with it. So finding teeth and heel of foot bones uh, is not proof of anything except that a lion had existed somewhere else and had been skinned and felt important. Or if you find the long bones, now the, ar the forearms, the legs, the ribs, and those things are stronger proofs that a real lion existed, but all it proves was there was an animal there and it died there but where was it born maybe it came in by sea or land and poured it in a cage and we know that the egyptians did that because they had illustrations in their tombs of sending lions and leopards around so yeah the lord of mycenae could have had uh been rich enough to have a lion brought in to parade around his palace or have a little menagerie and the lion died and he found his bones. Doesn't prove anything. And, uh, but the killer argument against the long bones, the osteological long bones, was that all the examples had been found in a tight little place right here. Southern Greece, the Peloponnesus, 
and all belonged to the late Bronze Age. Now, why? If there were a big population of lions down here, why don't we find some bones up here? Hmm? Northern Greek. And why don't we find any older? Middle Bronze, Early Bronze, Neolithic. This looks suspiciously like rich Mycenaean lords importing pets for their pounds. And it really does make a lot of sense, that argument. It's a, it's a good argument against real lions in Greece, because if you look at the valleys coming down from what we call the Balkans, which was former Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, it's all interconnected. And that was the status in 1998 when I started writing the article that you mentioned for my professor, Sarah Emmerbar. And I was going to uh, talk about the Mycenaean lion up to date. And I wanted to include some bones. And the argument, as you know, they were there and they were demolished. But then I read that the woman who had found that heel bone at Tiran's was named Angela von Dendrich. And here she is. And she was a veterinarian turned archaeologist who had published some of the classic books on how to recognize and distinguish animal bones, which is not so easy. In fact, recently, uh, uh, one of my helper friends in Greece wrote me and said, <clears throat> you know, we run these six-week crash courses for students in the summer on how to go out and pick up bones. And they can distinguish a cow from a pig, but it takes a really rare expert to be able to even see the lion bone in the, all the collection of bones. Not many people can do it. And Jackie can. And also, he said, People in the past have not really been interested in animal bones. What they wanted was human bones. They wanted the Lord of Mycenae. They wanted to see the, the family resemblances, you know, who was King Tut's mother and that kind of thing. And they didn't much care about animals unless they were studying them for the diet. And then they wanted to see what they ate. But as far as lions went, if you didn't find a lion bone, don't be surprised because most people couldn't recognize it anyway. And also the lion is the apex predator. So who's taking down the lion? There won't be many. And so I got the idea that I would write to Angela von den Driesch, a real letter. She was in Munich. And I wrote her and I said, I would appreciate if you could tell me something about your student who has published a dissertation on the bones from the Balkans, because that would help fill in that big gap. And so about four weeks later in the mail came the dissertation in German about the Balkans with the list of all the bones that had been found in those countries with the titles like this, Romania, a lot has been found, Bulgaria. She started sending me the articles or translating the titles or helping me with the names of the bone parts so that I could compile a very good uh, catalog, finally, of real lion bones. There she is. She's the one who found the heel at Tiran's. And the next year, they found some ribs. And a couple of years after that, they found the forearm at different levels at Kieran's, three different levels, so at least three different lines, and long bones. And she said, the bones had cut marks where they'd been skinned. And it, then she said the kid, she said, lion meat is tasty. <laughs> and you wonder, how does she know? But she had excavated in Turkey where there were still lions. And I can just imagine her some evening around the campfire with the local guys, you know, who showed her how to cook a lion. And she put me in touch with other archaeozoologists so that in 2004, 
Roger, my husband, and I went to Egg, another island off the coast of Athens, to the uh, Austrian open air bone lab. And there we saw what it's like to spread out the bones and look at them and classify them. And this was the catalog that emerged from all that correspondence and help that Angela von Dendrich and David Reese from Yale, who apparently helped all his, everybody by keeping a sort of a satellite eyeball up there for whatever you're interested in. And now, look, it's not just down in the lower part of Greece. It is up in the northern areas. And it is the earlier times. It goes all the way up to Kiev. Several were found in the Ukraine and published in Russian before the Iron Curtain fell. And people in the West didn't know about it. So, yes, the distribution and the time frame did fill in the gap. And what we finally ended up with was uh, enough to validate real lions, except with that killer argument that it was bobcats and mountain lions all along. Now, that, that's a showstopper. You know, if, who could say what came out of the mountains? What attacked Xerxes camels? And then I noticed a little footnote somewhere that said, there is no such thing as a mountain lion in the old world. There's no bobcats in the old world. It's entirely a new world animal. Isn't that interesting? It couldn't have been any of that because they only existed in the new world. And mountain lion and bobcat and so forth are really just colloquialisms for jaguars and pumas, and in the old world, rather, in Europe and Asia, there are only four big cats, the lion, the leopard, the tiger, and the cheetah, and that's it. The next smaller one is the lynx, and it's not hard to recognize a lynx bone from a lion bone, and smaller than that is the fetus sylvestris, the wild cat. So if you've got what looks like lion bones and lion testimony, it's going to be the lion. Bonafide panthera leo is the African maned lion. Smaller, yes. Rare, surely. Not big prides of them, but existing. And this is the, today I'll, I have three maps that show what people think was the track of the lion. In the Neolithic, which would have been, say, <clears throat> 8,000 to 3,000 BC, the lion existed uh, heavily in Asia Minor, Turkey, and crossed what was probably a land bridge into Europe and spread north toward the sea and then down into Greece in the Bronze Age, 3,000 to 1,000. And then, because people were proliferating and cutting down trees and destroying the forests that the lions needed for a habitat, they began to retreat back across, perhaps, or just disappear out of uh, Greece, and a little holdout up along the uh, coast of the Black Sea near Odessa, and still in Syria and Turkey and Israel, where they were seen up into modern time. Now, the question is, were those early lion bones imported? Real panther Leo, but still imported in a ship. And the answer was no, because some of these were so Early, there was no seaborne contact with Egypt, for example. And one of the best places is this little village called Durankalak in Bulgaria on the coast of the Black Sea, where they found 10 bones, a male big, a female 
probably not quite so big and more small, be a juvenile. That sure sounds like a family. You aren't going to be importing a family like that. And the odd thing about it, Duran Collect, was that they, they found these phones at a hunting site, just kind of remote bush place, not in the village. And the head and the feet were all cut off. They were missing, which is weird. Where were they? Well, maybe they took those back to the village where they've not been found. And so this makes it look like maybe you could sometimes find the teeth and the claws and say, well, that wasn't from an imported pelt. That was the residue from a local hunt. Maybe an alternate explanation. Here's the collection of bones to date. And there are enough Unusual families, long bones, uh, shoulder blades, parts at the bottom one is in, down into the classical period. Twelve bones, five animals, different levels of time. It really does look like a population, however small. And this is uh, a comparison from Balkans and, the, and Greece. There are 40 sites. And 64 individual animals could be constructed from all those bones, whereas in Egypt, in the same time frame, there are only four sites, and only 10 individual lines could be put together. And this, to me, is counterintuitive, because I think of Egypt as the land of lions, you know, as Africa, after all. We should have no trouble, go behind the pyramid and kill a lion. But apparently, lions had already become almost extinct there long before they had become extinct in grief. Probably because there's such a narrow little livability area in Egypt along the Nile, and the people were getting dense there, whereas in Greece and the Balkans, they weren't quite so heavily populated. There was more habitat longer in the north. What happened at human encounters? Well, we know this is the heel bone on the left. We know that they, uh, the bones were skinned. The animals were skinned and cut. Some of them were burned. Can't tell from the burning whether they were being cooked or sacrificed on an altar, which would be a religious ritual. Can't really tell. But they were burned. Were they associated with special objects like um, Rita, the, the, the ceremonial drinking vessels, or special urns and things like that? Not really. The only thing they were, that was the common denominator in this whole collection of bones and art was hunting. Hunting. It makes sense. So rather than look again at the possible parallels in Egypt and Greece, I'd like to just take them one day in the life of the lion in Greece and see what in the art might have, the lion would have said, this was part of my real experience. How much real life lion experience do we find in the art? Well, we find nursing, we find feeding, we do not find mating for climbing trees. We find a lot of honey, all kinds of animals. And this, again, is validated by the photography in Africa. We find images of people going up against lions in the, in the Mycenaean art, and we find real you know, lion trainers working with their animals. So you see that this sort of a encounter could happen. We find images of, on the right, two men tying up a lion. Maybe they captured him. Maybe he's dead. Who knows what they're going to do with him. And we find these famous Encounters with people 
in a violent way. And I want to tell you something most interesting. In 1910, Theodore Roosevelt, our former president at that time, had gone on a big game hunt with the 90 warriors in what at that point was British East Africa. He asked the 90 people to help him flush out a lion because he and his group wanted to you know, shoot some lions. And the 90 said, we'll flush it out for you, but you have to let us kill it with our spears. Felt it. Go ahead. And Roosevelt wrote down what it was like. I quote, the warriors carried oxide shields and the war spear. They came up at a run and gradually began to form a ring around the line. Each man crouched behind his shield, his spear in his right hand, his fierce, eager face peering over the shield rim. The lion saw where the line was, line was thinnest and charged at his topmost speed. The men in front braced themselves for the rush. The leader's long spear flickered and plunged, entering at one shoulder. It came out the opposite flank a yard of steel through the great body. Rearing, the lion struck the man, bearing down the shield. But on the instant, I saw another spear driven clear through the body from side to side. The end had come. As the lion fell, he gripped in his jaws such with such tremendous force that he bent the spear double. Then the warriors were round and over him, stabbing and shouting, wild with furious exultation. End of quotation. Here's the photograph from that hunt. The dead lion with the bent spear in his mouth. So, from the lion's point of view, it would seem that his encounters with men, as shown in Mycenaean art, could have been real. But that's not the only kind of lion art there is. There's beyond the natural lion, which we've been talking about, there's also designer lion, too beautiful to be true, and conceptual lion, like lion flanking the pillar of a palace, which seems to be more of an idea you know, an ideology rather than a view from nature. And then there are those strange contorted poses that don't make any sense. But if you look enough in Africa, you'll find even that. And even the too beautiful to be real poses, lions seem to group themselves naturally that way. And the ones that look like an idea of a man dominating a lion, well, you can see that too in reality. So perhaps there was nature behind more Mycenaean art than we realize. Now back to our original question. Was Herodotus right? Were there lions in Greece in classical times when the Persians came through northern Greece by Mount Olympus? And if we overlay the bone map with the Persian invasion map, we can see that right up at the very top of the Aegean Sea, lion bones have been found in that area. Just not quite late enough. There's about a 200-year gap between the latest lion bone found around Mount Olympus and the invasion by Xerxes. So maybe... We'll never find them. Maybe we will. I'm sure we'll find out. Thank you very much for going with me to explore lions in ancient Greek. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>